All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate seeing all of you here. Um, our forum tonight is called The Truth Behind the Numbers, Why Overdose Deaths Have Surpassed Homicides Here in Louisiana, in New Orleans. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. And my name is Mary Lou McCall, and I am so grateful to be here today. Um, I am a prevention specialist, a substance abuse prevention specialist with Action Against Addiction. And what that means is um, I go out into the community, into school systems, anywhere that they ask us to come, but on a federal grant primarily and one private grant. And we teach the brain science of addiction because we know in our field that it is a preventable brain disease just like cancer is preventable if we take the right health measures, um, diabetes, heart disease, things like that. We know that you can prevent the brain disease of of addiction if we teach our young people, if we teach our community, if we teach our parents about this and give them the tools. So that's what I do. Um, I also have a son. I have five sons, but my oldest son is eight years in recovery from a heroin addiction uh, that began with opiates, that began with marijuana, that began with alcohol. So that's a trajectory we're also going to talk about. So even though it's very painful, this epidemic, we know there is hope out there, and that's why we want to educate the public tonight. Um, I also want to thank Xavier University for allowing us to do this, and a shout out to Chantel Dant. Uh, you're always putting things together like this, and we really appreciate your support uh, and your leadership in this area because we're about saving lives. We also want to thank the American Addiction Centers and Townsend Treatment Centers, and Joy Sutton, who put this whole thing together and has worked really hard on this. And is Patricia Benitez in here too? Patricia, oh yeah, she's like your soldier on, on the ground. She's how I first met you guys. You know, I saw her at a bunch of meetings and she's very passionate about what she does and she's really a good soldier here in our community. I know that for sure because I've seen her in action. Um, I also want to thank you guys for coming, all of you in the audience, because these are the, the experts that's on the panel tonight. They've been trained in this area, they know the science but they need your help. This is a community problem, this is a national problem, this is actually an international problem. I'm gonna talk more about that later because I just came back from the National Prescription Drug Abuse Conference. It's a heroin conference, it was a heroin summit, and all the great leaders from across the nation were there, from the National Institute of Health to the U.S. Surgeon General to Dr. Nora Volokhov from NIDA, SAMHSA was there, the FDA was there, talking about how they regulate opiates and other drugs, and there were lots of treatment and prevention officials there and lay people from coalitions who are trying to fight this. This is a battle that we cannot fight alone, that if we unify, that is nonpartisan, that's one thing they talked about there because Newt Gingrich was there as well as um, <coughs> former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, uh, that we can, we can win this if we put forth the right efforts. Okay, let's begin because the U.S. Surgeon General the Vice Admiral Vivek Murphy said this week at that conference, he said, this is a public health crisis that demands a public health solution. And the acting director of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, they said many things, and she said, this is an emergency. So it's a good thing we're doing this tonight. How bad is it? Well, 91 people die of an opiate overdose every single day. And as we're in here, one person will die every 16 minutes. Think about that. It's a terrible attack against human life. In 2015, 33 people died, 33,000 people died of an opiate-related overdose. 33,000 people. And if you just add up those numbers as the years go by, it's awful. Just last month here in New Orleans, Dr. Jeffrey Rouse, who is our coroner, who's very passionate about this, he released a report that showed for the first time in our city's history, overdose deaths have surpassed homicides. And we know from watching the news that homicides are up too. In fact, accidental drug-related deaths more than doubled from 2015 to 2016 in New Orleans. And last year, there were 211 deaths. So tonight, really, what we are about is giving you information, educating you, and saving lives trying to come up with some knowledge and some solutions to save lives because what's happening is preventable. And the opiate crisis was preventable as well. So I'd like to also tell you that um, there, there's going to be some counselors and some officials here if you have questions for loved ones, 
If you need to ask people confidentially, they will be here from the American Addiction Centers. They're available to talk with you after the forum tonight and lead you in the right direction. Um, the Townsend Treatment Center, of course, is sponsoring this, and, and they have um, um, facilities here as well. And there are other people that I see in the audience that are here tonight, too, American um, Act Addiction Recovery Resources, and some other people that I've worked with in the past, they're here as well. Let me introduce our wonderful panel here who've worked so hard on this. First, to my right, is Michael Cartwright. He is the CEO and Chairman of American Addiction Centers. He is known as an addiction industry author, a national speaker, and a trailblazer. He really is in this field. Michael Cartwright has been a behavioral health care entrepreneur for 20 years. From government grants, Medicaid and Medicare, to commercial insurance and private pay, Michael has provided services to many population segments over these years. The culmination of his research and experience are the foundation of his book, Believable Hope, Five Essential Elements to Beat Any Addiction, and there are all kinds of addictions out there, as we know. In the book, he also shares his personal struggles with addiction. He will be giving away free copies of his book tonight, as well as signing copies, and I'm really grateful that he's willing to talk about it, because one big thing we know we have to do is to remove that stigma and teach people this is a medical disease that we should be able to talk about like anything else without shame or a stigma attached to it. And next to him, we have Dr., well, on the other side, I'm sorry, Dr. Roy Airy, an emergency medical specialist at University Medical Center and a physician with Townsend. Dr. Airy has been practicing as an academic and clinical emergency physician since 1992. He's been in private practice in addiction medicine since 2006. He is board certified in emergency medicine and is certified by the American Board of Addiction Medicine. Currently, he is an assistant clinical professor at LSU Med School, internal medicine. Um, he's at University Medical Center in New Orleans. He also has a separate practice in addiction medicine at Townsend. Then we have Dr. Jessica Johnson, and she is in the center. Um, she's an associate professor at Xavier University College of Pharmacy, which is an important school on this issue of opiate addiction. As an associate professor at Xavier University, Dr. Johnson coordinates an interprofessional ed education elective course. She also precepts third and fourth year clinical rotations and pharmacy practice residents at her clinical site, the medical intensive care unit at Interim Louisiana Hospital here in New Orleans. Her research interests include sedative and analgesic use in the ICU, alcohol withdrawal, interprofessional education, and self authorship in pharmacy education. Then we go to the end of this table on my left-hand side, and we have Dr. Thomas Maestri. He is a clinical assistant professor at Xavier University College of Pharmacy. As part of his role as a clinical assistant professor at Xavier University, Dr. Maestri also works in the Acute Behavioral Health Department for University Medical Center. As part of his duties, he is a clinical pharmacy specialist in psychiatry who works directly with patients with acute psychotic mood and substance abuse disorders. He also offers experiential and didactic learning to the students of the College of Pharmacy in psychopharmacology. Thank you for being with us. And next to him on my left is Dr. Howard Wetzman, Chief Medical Officer of Townsend. Dr. Wetzman is the addiction psychiatrist who specializes in the outpatient treatment of addiction. He is the chief medical officer and founder of Townsend, a network treatment center uh, across South Louisiana. He's a clinical associate professor at LSU School of Medicine and is a distinguished fellow of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. Dr. Wetzman has offered, authored three books, including Questions and Answers on Addiction, which he is giving away tonight free, and he will sign. Um, he also has a blog at addictiondoctor.org. Thank you for being with, with us as well. Okay, so I want to repeat again that there will also be some people out there uh, to answer your questions, treatment consultants, if you have any questions at all, because we're not going to get through everything tonight, I know that. So I'd like to start off with um, Dr. Airy. And the first thing I think that I think is really important, and I know this as a layperson because there was a day that I knew nothing about addiction. 
and what that really is, the brain science of addiction. And I wanted to give an example because I think this kind of wraps it up. When I um, was in Russia doing a documentary, and I did television for 30 years, um, I interviewed a young man who was protesting the sale of alcohol. And I didn't understand why, because I didn't know anything about addiction. I thought Russians drank vodka to stay warm, right, at, in the cold winter. And he said that the communists under communism used alcohol to oppress the citizens, to control their minds so that they wouldn't revolt and seek freedom. So with that example, really what we're talking about here is kind of like an enslavement, a bondage of the mind with drugs and alcohol. Is it not? So can you explain scientifically what that means? That's what it looks like. Well, I don't think it's a concerted effort by any entity. But I think when you become addicted to drugs, you are, in essence, uh, captured by that drug. And you have no control. That is, in essence, the definition of, the, uh, of an addiction is you have uh, no control over the substance use. It controls your life. Your life is revolving around uh, procuring and using uh, the particular drug that you're addicted to. OK. And in our city, we have a tremendous opiate crisis. There are many kinds of, of crises in, um, in drug addiction. But why do we have an epidemic of opiates? What is happening here that is making opiates in epidemic proportions? Well, um, I'm sure some members of this audience may know that uh, we have a lot of opioid prescriptions being written. Louisiana is one of eight states that the number of opioid prescriptions written exceeds the number of residents. There are 4.8 million opioid prescriptions written last year. We only have 4.6 million people in the state of Louisiana. So that becomes a real problem. Uh, some of those people will become uh, dependent upon the opioids. Some of them will transition to heroin. Mm -hmm. And that in of itself is a, another problem that we're facing with the strength of the heroin increasing because of it being laced with uh, fentanyl. Right, we'll talk about that too. But uh, try, and anybody can answer this that, that maybe can answer it. How does an opiate work in your brain that makes it so hard to, to get off of? When I was in, at the uh, summit this week, they said that if somebody is on an opiate, especially young people, longer than five days, chances are they're gonna be addicted. What is it about opiates that makes them so addictive? And why is it so hard to get well from an opiate addiction? Well, again, it, it hijacks the, the pleasure system and directly uh, affects the reward and the motivation system of the brain. Uh, so when you start using a drug, you lose pleasure in other things when you mm -hmm. become addicted to it. It also captures that reward. The reward is I must use uh, of the drug that I've become addicted to. Right. Uh, the motivation is reinforced that I must seek the drug. Uh, and again, the pleasure aspect decreases, uh, but you're using the drug to fulfill the need of trying to s get to a state of normalcy. Uh -huh. And I think Dr. Wetzman would probably you know, discuss that more, if you're willing to, Howard. Yeah, would, would you like to add to that before we move on from that question? I think that uh, part of the problem is that we've been fighting uh, the problem of addiction with a very old definition that was first written down in 1981 by the American Psychiatric Association. And the first research done on the brain illness of addiction wasn't until 1988. And we're still using that same definition. There have been some tweaks to it, but, but in essence it says you're normal, you use a drug, that you like that drug, you get hooked on that drug, and then that drug starts to uh, control things. And when it starts to control things, you exhibit behavioral symptoms, and that's when we can call you this diagnosis of addiction. Uh, about five years ago, the American Society of Addiction Medicine created the first new definition of addiction that was actually based on the science that had been done. And it was in 180 degrees opposite from the American Psychiatric Association's definition. It said addiction is a primary brain illness. Primary illness means it does not require a cause. It can exist from birth. That it is a primary brain illness, that it's chronic, that it involves particular parts of the brain, including the reward and memory centers, that this illness has symptoms, and it is the symptoms that drive people to use substances or other behaviors. It's not limited to substances. 
And so we've been actually using the APA definition for much longer than it's actually existed. It's the way we think about addiction in our culture, that addiction is caused by drugs. And if we could just get rid of the drug, we wouldn't have this problem. And so we've had the war on drugs since the 70s, but in fact, since 1905, this country has been making laws against drugs. It hasn't worked for over 100 years. It isn't going to work. But with the new definition, based on actual science, we now actually have a chance to, instead of going from drug to drug to drug, we have a chance to address the underlying brain disease. Okay. I saw um, at the very first summit on prescription drug abuse, Dr. Nora Volkov put up on the screen uh, the chemical properties of Oxycontin and Vicodin. And she told us back then, six years ago, that it had, they had almost the same chemical makeups of heroin and cocaine. And so, therefore, the drug companies knew what they were producing and knew they were addicted, addictive and knew that people would get addicted and that people, but they didn't tell anybody, okay? And so now we have this epidemic that was, was theoretically going to be preventable had they told everybody, kind of like the tobacco um, epidemic that we had at one time. So what my question to you is, why, who could, I would like you, doctor, to talk about maybe the chemical properties of these opiates. Tell people what kind of opiates are we talking about? Because for us who say opiates, maybe some in the audience doesn't know, number one, what an opiate is, it, which kind of drug it is that's out there that's so readily available. So our opiates are basically uh, the best form of pain management that we have today in terms of treatment. The problem is with it, is, as they had mentioned, is that they're, they're very high in uh, dependence rates and tolerance rates as well. And one thing that's, that, that is interesting, as you had mentioned, is that each of these medications are very, very similar in structure. And I think the, the thing to understand is that the, the stigma between the, the agents is very different. If somebody says um, they're on heroin, they're looked on much differently than somebody that says I'm on uh, Tylenol with codeine or something for a cough. And so even though the difference in structure is very small, the, the opinions of these, of these agents are very, very different. And it's important to know that all of these agents are very similar. They're in the same class, and they all have the same type of effect. Some are just more potent than others, but they can still have the same addictive properties, the same type of tolerance and dependence, and um, it can have an effect on, on populations just the same in, in terms of some of the lower potency agents than some of the higher potency agents like heroin can. Okay, but w we also learned that more than 80% of the prescriptions for pain medications, for opiate medications, occur right here in the United States, out of all the world. Are we in that much pain? Um, I think opioids work well for acute pain. Uh, however, for chronic pain, pain lasting uh, longer than five days, uh, they, are, they don't work well. If you look at the prescriptions written, over half of the opioid prescriptions are written by family practitioners. But the ones who prescribe uh, the most are pain management doctors and specialists such as orthopedics. Um, neurosurgeons. Again, over a period of time, chronic opioid use actually does little uh, to treat uh, pain. It actually increases uh, the perception of pain by a condition called hyperalgesia. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot tell me or show me why somebody with chronic back pain is getting any benefit from opioid therapy. It just does not work that way. There are so many other things we can do for uh, chronic back pain or chronic pain uh, rather than prescribe uh, opioid therapy long term. And that's something else they talked about. They said there are three reasons for, and they admitted it, and, and we had the top doctors there admitting that, first of all, the drug companies basically didn't give the information of what these things were going to do, make people addicted quickly and for a long time and kill them in some cases. Number two, that many doctors were over-prescribing and prescribing pills that they shouldn't have prescribed to certain patients. We watched an HBO film, in fact, where a young girl, and they had every one of her bottles lined up while we were there. We watched this film, and it was 30 pills of oxycodone, 40 pills of Percocet, 
from all these different doctors that were prescribing. And then the third thing was that the FDA approved these drugs. And not only did they approve the drugs that are currently out there, they just approved eight more opiates. Um, and we have this epidemic going on. If you look at the reason why we have an opioid prescription problem, there's three reasons. I think the pharmaceutical company is advocating this, uh, that they're safe. There's been okay. suits in other states about uh, the pharmaceutical um, companies promoting their uh, drug as safe and effective mm -hmm. for chronic pain, which it is not. Uh, two is physicians. Physicians have to do a better job of educating themselves about the dangers of opioid prescribing. And three, there's the patient demand. Patients are demanding opioids, and we have to learn to say no. Right. Dr. Johnson, can you talk about what happens? What happens when somebody becomes addicted to an opiate, and how can you tell if they're starting to become addicted, if they're becoming addicted? What are some of the symptoms? Well, so when you take an opiate, um, and these, these substances started from poppies, right? We, f we first discovered this chemical. It's naturally produced in the environment, in the poppy flower. And people started using these substances, and the way they work in your brain, they work two different places in your brain. Um, in one place in your brain, they, they affect your emotions. They cause you to feel relaxed and happy, and um, it's, it's a very pleasurable feeling. In the other part of your brain, they can work to um, relieve symptoms, unpleasant feelings like pain. And we also find these in cough medications. They can suppress the unpleasant feeling of a cough. So most of the time, patients take these medications because they feel unpleasant feelings and they want those feelings to go away. So you take an opiate to eliminate unpleasant feelings and then they cause you to feel better. And then the drugs, they, they only work for, depending on uh, which one you take, they might last for 30 minutes or an hour or a couple of hours, and then the feelings start to return back to normal. The unpleasant feelings come back, and the pleasant feelings go away, and so you, you take another dose. And over time, as you start to change your brain chemistry with these drugs, your brain starts to ask for higher and higher doses to achieve the same feeling. And that progression of tolerance, of wanting more and more of a drug to achieve the same effect, runs alongside of addiction. It's not the exact same thing as addiction, but it runs alongside of addiction. And so one of the symptoms of a patient who's experiencing tolerance, who may be experiencing addiction, is that you don't feel like it works well enough for you and you want more. Maybe you take four of your pills a day instead of two, or you, you feel like you need six a day instead of five, and so you need more and more of them. And then patients start to run out. Your prescription that you got, it runs out sooner than the end of the month, and so you go back to your doctor and you say, this works really well for me, but I need more. And, and I think that you know, part of our problem is not that the doctors are, are maliciously prescribing these things, but, but someone comes to them and says, it hurts. It hurts and I don't know what else to do about it. And the doctors, it's, it's I mean, what, what else can you do? You want to help people. You went into the field of medicine to help people and so you give them what they've asked for because you think it will help. And so I agree that I think recognizing when patients start to ask for more and more, um, that's a sign of dependence, that's a sign of addiction, and we need to start thinking both preventing that by, um, by not giving those early refills and not directing them to other therapies for their pain management and, and um, I mean, did that? Did yeah, that, that does. Question? You did an excellent job of that. Um, and th now there's a prescription drug monitoring program. And how effective has that been? How, do, how effective do you feel that's been? I think any of you can. Yeah. So the the prescription monitoring program is run by Louisiana's Board of Pharmacy, and we basically ask that any time a prescription is filled at a pharmacy, we submit that information to the central database, mm -hmm. and then. When another pharmacy goes to fill a prescription, we can look at the database and see. And, and the goal of this was to 
reduce diversion of drugs to prevent patients from getting a prescription filled here on day one and here on day two, and now they have a double supply. They can keep some and sell some, and it works to an extent. Um, it does help pharmacists to identify patients who frequently fill prescriptions for opiates. And with that comes the opportunity for us to make interventions for those patients and potentially refer them to addiction centers. One of the limitations of that system is that our Louisiana system doesn't communicate well with other systems in other states. And you know how close we are to Mississippi, to Texas. And so it's very easy for patients to fill one prescription in Louisiana and fill another prescription in Mississippi, and there's not a lot of crosstalk between states. I think the prescription monitoring program does some to reduce diversion and addiction, but it, it can't solve the problem entirely. All right, thanks. Let's talk, Dr. Wetzman, about who you're seeing in your clinics. Who's coming in? Because I think sometimes people have this idea that an addict is, is a bum on the street. But especially in the opiate realm, that's not at all who they are. Well, unfortunately, I think society's only noticed opioids because recently we've started to see people die who have had access to people in power. Mm -hmm. uh, addiction's been with us for many, many years. People have been dying sure. of addiction for many, many years. Um, and people who've been treating people with addiction uh, have always seen that addiction crosses every ethnic, class, culture, nationality, gender, every line you want to draw between people, addiction cuts right across it. And there's no difference. There may be a difference in what drug one group uses than another because of, because of culture and accessibility, but uh, really addiction is found in the same 10 to 20 percent of the population, regardless of what population you look at. And so who has addiction today? It's the same people who are sitting in this room. Ten, you look at any group of people and 10 to 20 percent are going to have addiction. 10 to 20 percent of people at the Saints game have addiction. 10 to 20 percent of the people who voted in the last presidential election have addiction. 10 to 20 percent of the people in this room have addiction. 10 to 20 percent of the people in your place of worship have addiction. And that's who comes to treatment. And uh, opiate addiction specifically is uh, what I read an article that it's, it's a lot of um, women, white women perhaps, 40 to 50 years old, they go in for some pain management. They had an accident or they had an operation and they become addicted and they can't get their pills anymore so they cross over to street heroin. Well, well you know, there's a, there's a number of, of cultural narratives we're, we're mm -hmm. hearing right now about within the opioid crisis. And if you go back and you read about the last two opioid crises in this country, the one that happened in the late 1800s to about 1910 and the one that happened in the 1960s ending around the middle of the 1970s, you'll see the same kind of, of, uh, of message that um, toward the end of the crisis, we start to hear this message about how people who, quote, shouldn't be dying from opioids are now dying of opioids. Well, the truth is no one should, should die of addiction. And um, th I'm really grateful that whatever's happened has, has gotten us talking about it. But the truth is that um, when the opioid crisis is over, just as many people will be dying of addiction. They just, uh, will, it'll go back under the way it was 10 years ago. And so if anyone can take anything home from tonight, it is uh, when this crisis is over, don't forget that addiction will still be there and there's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot, it's still a medical condition. And the thing a lot of people are asking, because more and more young people are getting hold of the pills. I was told that um, there are two ways they're getting them, through the prescriptions, and then they're getting them from friends. You know, they're taking them out of parents' uh, medicine cabinets. Some people are going into houses, looking for homes, real estate homes, stealing pills out of other people's cabinets. Uh, is that what you're seeing? Is that how they're getting them, the young people? Because they have little parties that they call skittle parties where they dump everything into a bowl and spin the bottle and then grab in and eat the pills. I think that, you know, the, the traditionally the, the biggest source of opioids were always uh, those diverted from uh, work people being in the home or uh, people going into open houses and, and looking through cabinets or kids getting them from mom's cabinet. But um, actually, uh, 
what we're seeing more of now is just um, uh, street sales or direct sales uh, from a physician. Mm -hmm. And you know that our state uh, saw that pain clinics had set themselves up uh, with less than medical strictness as to who they treated. And they, you've heard the term pain mills mm -hmm. or pill mills. Mm -hmm. And um, as Dr. Airy mentioned, there's no medical evidence whatsoever that, that opioids work for chronic pain beyond three months. And there's a good amount of evidence that while people may feel uh, pain relief after that, that function decreases greatly. Mm -hmm. And so when, when uh, the government stepped in on the, on the pill mills, uh, when that supply drained, uh, then that's when you saw the the rise of uh, street heroin that was actually predicted, but um, you know the same political right. effort had to be made, and they right. made that effort. Right. We're going to talk more about that, but I wanted to bring in Michael Cartwright because we talk about the figures, we talk about people being addicted, but there's fa there's a face to all this. There are human beings who are sick and suffering. There are families who are mourning their loved ones who are dead. You are somebody who is willing to bring your story to the forefront and talk about this and use that to produce good. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're doing this? Because I know you're very passionate from the little bit no. I spoke to you. No, I'm extremely passionate. I, I, I do want to go back to what Dr. Wetzman said. Mm -hmm. Whatever you take out of this meeting, remember 10 to 20 percent of the population is addicted. Right, they have a brain disease. We, we continue to talk about the op opioids, we continue to talk about the pill mills, we continue to talk about the drugs as though they're the bad thing. And I'm not saying they're not, we do have an issue with physicians over prescribing, we have a, a more of an issue with patients asking for it over and over, but, I, but we, we have to go back to what Dr. Wetzman was saying, that 10 to 20% of everyone in this room has a brain disease. So what are we doing to solve the brain disease? Not how do, how do we fight the war on drugs or how do we stop the pain mill clinics? How do we you know, fight the folks from bringing cocaine? In the 80s, it was cocaine, right? Mm -hmm. It was just happening in neighborhoods that no one cared about. Today, it's happening in the suburbs where people vote, so now we're having this dialogue and discussion. But for a hundred years we've been fighting this war on drugs and it's not working, right? But we have to go back to what Dr. Wetzman is saying. How do, we, how do we understand the brain? How do we understand who has addiction, right? What kind of preventative measures can occur in middle school and high school to educate people that if they exhibit signs and symptoms of addiction, talk to someone? All across the United States right now, our public high schools and middle schools have no educational funding whatsoever for prevention programs. We Politicians have been talking about it across this country, how bad the disease is, how bad the crisis is, but we don't have any funding in public schools across America. If we're serious about it, we have to actually put it in our educational system, talk about it. We have to provide research dollars to understand the brain more effectively. Universities around the country are not being given the same amount of resources as we are for cancer or diabetes or heart disease. So where's the funding available to study the brain and understand some of the solutions to the problem? So I, I, I just want to make sure that we don't just focus on the opioid issue that we really focus on the brain itself and how do we solve that issue. So as a young child, I was born and I believed that I had had an addictive personality from the moment I was born. And I had that from a genetic standpoint. Both my mother and my father are addictive personalities. They have addictions. One was addicted to marijuana and pills. The other was addicted to alcohol, right? So starting in middle school, I picked up, started using, no one ever mentioned it to me. No one ever talked about educating me on the disease of addiction. I started using more and more all through high school, used more and more into college, and couldn't even pass college. Failed out of college multiple times because I couldn't keep myself together. But nowhere along that path did someone come along from an educational standpoint or a diagnostic standpoint to try to understand the brain and what was going on with me. 
I'd love to hear a little bit more from Howard because he has a really, I think, unique perspective, one of the, one of the most unique I've ever heard, kind of describing the brain and descri describing the addictive process on the brain, if you don't mind. I'm tired of hearing me, but okay. No. Um, <laughs> so, um, we, all of us, are mammals, and every mammal on the planet has the same reward system. Your dog has the exact same reward system you do. If you have a rabbit, exact same reward system. If you have a pet rat, exact same reward system. So scientists have been able to look at that same reward system in their pet rats, but they weren't really pets, in labs, and know an awful lot about how this reward system works. And the main chemical in the reward system is something called dopamine. When you have enough dopamine at the reward center, you feel like you have enough. And the people around you all seem like nice people. When you don't have enough dopamine in your reward system, you don't have enough of anything. And everyone around you is wanting the last little bit of what you don't have enough of. And it starts to feel irritated. You get irritated. So you start to look for more dopamine. Any low dopamine mammal will. And when you find a source of dopamine, it doesn't last very long. You get a dopamine high followed by a dopamine crash. And so because it doesn't last very long, you're always discontented. And because you don't have enough and you're feeling irritated, you're always looking around and never sitting still, constantly looking for that, and then, it, then not getting satisfied, you could say you feel restless, irritable, and discontented. And those are the words actually used by a doctor in the 1930s, Dr. Silkworth, who wrote still the best neurobiological description of this disease ever put on paper. Now, he didn't know anything about why it happened. He didn't understand the disease, but he was a very good observer. And he wrote this opinion of what this disease is. And those words are still quite true today. So if you're going to look at who should we look at at age five, to say, this person that doesn't have enough dopamine and we should intervene for this child so that something happens to him for him before he's tall enough to reach the beer off, off the counter, we'd be looking for restless, irritable, and discontent. Now, unfortunately, most of our childhood interventions right now are not based on understanding the brain biology of addiction. And so we're making lots of other diagnoses in kids. And uh, we're not making diagnoses of early addiction because our social construct about addiction means there has to be a drug involved. So what are we going to call someone with addiction before they found the drug or after they found the, or that after they put the drug down? Well, we've made up names for that before they find the drug, and we've made up different names for what those symptoms look like after they put down the drug. Unfortunately, the treatments for those names aren't the same best treatments we'd use for the disease of addiction. So if we understood more about dopamine tone and the genetics of it, and more than that, how we can socially drive someone's dopamine tone down even with normal genetics, we would change most of what we do I in how we raise our children and how we teach them in school yeah. and uh, how we treat each other. And that's the only way we're ever going to really prevent addiction. I love that. I love that. And, and since you brought it up, Michael Carton, right, I have, the brain is my favorite topic, and that's what we teach is the brain science of addiction. So let's dial it back a little bit further, because I'd like to ask um, Dr. Maestri a question. Um, we always teach that it takes at least 24 years for a girl's brain to grow up, and maybe 26, 27 for a boy's brain to grow up. Um, but that's just the way you were made. So uh, if a, in our city we've normalized alcohol, let's say. It's normal. You know, it's at every fair, it's at every festival. And so kids are reared thinking that this is normal to drink alcohol. And what we know with the science is that if you, um, if you drink at 15 or younger, you're four to five, maybe even six times more likely if you consecutively the next few years drink to become addicted than if you wait until you're 21, which is the legal drinking age because the brain is developing up at least until you're 21, and it hijacks the development. One glass of alcohol explodes into the underage brain like a chemical 
hand grenade. But a lot of kids, and I go into a lot of schools, and I go into a lot of inner city schools where kids are so stressed out, and they have to write their stories about stress. You know, family members who've been shot and killed, mothers who are dead because the fathers have killed the mother, just incredible stress. And some of them have these um, also mood disorders, uh, Dr. Maestri. And so they end up not liking how they feel, not liking those uncomfortable feelings, and they self-medicate. What are some things that you should look out for in a young person? Um, you know, because they don't want to go to to a parent and say, "I'm not feeling good." You know, I can't, I can't concentrate, or I'm feeling anxious. I mean, it's not cool to say those things. So, what does a parent, what does a loved one look out for with a mood disorder? That's a great question. I think it's 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 a great point uh, that with the decision making center of the brain, it takes about 25 years or so for it to actually develop fully. And so as they're going to these uh, drugs and alcohol, they're not able to fully develop the decision-making parts of their brain. And so we want to catch them before that, and, and that is very important. And, and a lot of times it's kind of tough, right? It's not always easy to say uh, that, they're, that something's wrong, and a lot of times uh, kids don't want to admit it to their, um, to their parents, especially on sensitive subjects like like the mind, and so I think it's very uh, important to open up dialogue, make them feel comfortable with sharing how they feel in certain situations. Are they feeling bad in a certain situation? Are they feeling good? And and just trying to open the communication and, and allowing them to, to admit when something's going wrong. I think that's the best um, best thing to do for these children because they, they a lot of times know when something's wrong but they're not willing to admit it they're not willing to talk to their family about it and so we need to be very vigilant in monitoring them and watching watching their behaviors is something out of the, nor the norm for what they normally do and that's not the same from one child to another it's always going to be very different but I think it's very important to monitor and to be able to um, realize when their behaviors are, are a little bit out of the norm and when they need to, to decide to, to uh, seek out treatment for those things. And also the behavior of the parent, the role modeling, because I know that young people self-report in anonymous surveys that what a parent says or does matters more to them than even their peer pressure. So the behavior that a parent is modeling, coming home from work, I'm, oh God, I'm stressed out, I have to have a drink, or maybe some of the things that you might have dealt with, uh, Michael, when you were a young person. You have 25 years in recovery. Yeah, I do. I, and, and you're right. I do think it starts in the home. I do think that you are modeling behavior. I had multiple people in my home using drugs and alcohol. I had friends and family members using drugs and alcohol. I think that leads you into it, but I, I still go back to what Dr. Wetzman says. 10 to 20 percent of us are going to be addictive. There's other people that grew up in my household, cousins, uncles. They didn't have an addictive personality. They did pick up a drink early, but they, it didn't lead to addiction. And so I still think we have to go back and, and ask ourselves what's going on with the brain. We're just now starting to study it. We're probably still another 20 years behind where the mental health field is, and the mental health field is still struggling with understanding the brain. It's still one of the most complex organisms to understand, and the research that is out there today, I think it's going to change even more in the next 20 years in terms of how, what's the biology of what's going on in the brain, and then how do we treat that individual and so I still go back to we need more research to understand what's the best way to treat people we treated people 25 years ago totally different than we treat them today at least I feel like we did um, in terms it was primarily 12-step based approaches that I got sober through Alcoholics Anonymous so I still go to meetings and love it but no one ever talked about biology uh, very seldom talked about you know assessments and taking a look at what's going on both co-occurring disorders do you have other brain illnesses going on like depression anxiety uh, schizophrenia that can also amp someone's ability to reach out to drugs and alcohol to solve those problems so I think we're just starting to scratch the surface I, I love your reference to Dr. Silkworth because he is one of the geniuses in our field I go back to the research we did in the last 20 years at my company um, still comes back to 90, 90 meetings in 90 days. I don't know if you've ever heard that approach in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
what we found in 15 different federally funded research studies that if someone stays engaged in treatment, it doesn't have to be residential, um, it can be a brief intervention, but if somebody in stays engaged for 90 days, they're about 80% likely to stay clean and sober one year post-treatment. If someone stays engaged less than 30 days, they have about a 15% chance of staying clean and sober one year post-treatment. Is that so, because they're attached to something outside of themselves and it gives them a sense of purpose? I, I think it's, it's a combination of things. One, to change a behavior takes time. To change your uh, surroundings takes time. Uh, to really, uh, for, for me, myself, I had to uh, totally get away from family. I had to totally get away from friends. I had to uh, get away from the substances because I literally couldn't resist the urge, right? And so it, it's a combination of things that you, you have to change your brain patterns, you have to change your thinking, you have to change your surrounding, and that takes time. And so, and that's really without good science like Dr. Wetzman is talking about. Um, but I think if you can add into that, if, if, if payors, insurance companies, the federal government, as we're starting to look at treatment programs, could understand that this is a long-term disease. It's not a go to the hospital for three days and you're cured. Right? It's a long-term uh, disease that you have to be vigilant on. Because I'm sober over 25 years doesn't mean I can go out and have a drink. Right? It's, I can't pick up a substance again, or I do believe that I would immediately go back to that same kind of behavior that I was before. Mm -hmm. So a, again, I think there's still a lot more science that needs to be done, a lot more research of what works and what doesn't work in the treatment field. Um, and a lot more prevention and education, because prevention and education really does work. Uh, we've seen it in tobacco use in the United States. It's, tobacco use has not gone away, but if you take a look at tobacco use in the 1960s in this country, and you take a look at the tobacco use in 2016 in this country, it's dropped dramatically, right? We have to get rid of uh, the advertising and making it sexy. It used to be on every TV show in America, people were smoking cigarettes. Right? You could smoke cigarettes on a plane in this country. Right? Well, today, alcohol and other drugs have the same connotation. You can go anywhere in the city and go have a drink. Right? There's ads everywhere making it look popular and sexy and fun to go have a drink. And for the 80% of the population that's kind of the normies that we call it, they probably can. But for 10 to 20% of people like me, we can't. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've got to do a lot more in this country if we're serious about this illness uh, to research it, provide prevention and education, and not make it look so fun and sexy, right? So there's a combination of things that really need to happen for us to really get that use pattern in this country and not just talking about it as politicians, but really actually putting money behind that and research behind that and taking it seriously. I love what happened in Atlanta, you were talking about it earlier, mm -hmm. but I still go back to how much are they really putting into this disease? If you take a look at the prevention programs in the United States and how underfunded they are, That's true. it's like how serious are we about, about this problem? If you take a look at the research studies that are going on about this disease compared to other significant diseases, if you think about it, how many people did you say were dying every day? It's 91 like people. 91 There'd people. There'd be an uproar if it if, was any if other disease. 91 people were dying of anything else in this country, there would be an uproar in this country. And we would spend a trillion dollars to solve the issue, right? How much money have we spent overseas in foreign wars just in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. right? Can't we spend a similar amount of money to try to find out what's the best way to prevent this illness and treat this illness? And 129 overall a day are dying. That's just opiate addictions. And I guess uh, since that was uh, the subject of it, and it's so important to talk about the brain, I, I love how you're really pressing that because that really is it. And I find that in the schools that we go into. Remember in one little school I've been in like two years, and finally this one little boy suddenly shouted out in class, thank God you're here. I, if you hadn't told me this, I wouldn't have known. He had that aha moment where it finally clicked. This was all about him, you know, and his brain and his future. So, I mean, there is no replacing that. But unfortunately, the threats are getting greater. And Dr. Arya, you talked about fentanyl. And fentanyl, we know, is used in operations. Um, I, I, I know that somebody who just had an operation, a heart operation, and they used fentanyl to put them out. Um, but there's also carfentanyl, a synthetic. 
um, very powerful that they use for tranquilizer for elephants. And now, not only is the cocaine being laced with fentanyl, the heroin being laced with fentanyl, because fentanyl is a lot cheaper, they're now even sprinkling it on marijuana, and it is so powerful, and the people who are buying these drugs don't even know they're receiving it. And sometimes the people who are selling it, who bought it from a dealer, don't even know they're giving it to other people. So there's this greater threat out there. Can you talk about fentanyl, please? Because they're worried that it's going to start sweeping the nation. And if we think we have a, an epidemic now, it's going to get worse. That's what they were predicting at this conference. Uh, a few years ago, it used to be that two-thirds of the uh, opioid um, deaths were from prescription opioids. Uh, and one-third was from uh, heroin overdose. I think we're seeing a rise in the heroin overdoses uh, equaling that of prescription uh, uh, opioid uh, uh, overdoses. And I think part of that is because it's now being laced with um, fentanyl or carfentanil. Fentanyl is 50 to 100 times uh, more powerful than morphine or heroin. Carfentanil is 10,000 times uh, more powerful than um, uh, morphine. So it's being mixed with the heroin. Uh, it's a demand because it, it gives people a very good high, but it is playing Russian roulette when you use it. Uh, it's easy to smuggle in. A brick of uh, carfentanil could supply, you know, a, a state uh, for a year because all it takes is a little sprinkle here and there. Uh, there are about 3,000 to 6,000 pharmaceutical manufacturers in China that are unregulated that are producing uh, substances like fentanyl, uh, susfentanyl, and carfentanyl. And it's getting into the supply of heroin here. And the downside of that is that we may, may not be able to resuscitate those people. What I see in the emergency department is people who overdose and survive. Um, and we need to get those people into treatment. There's a gap between when I see them in the emergency department and getting them in treatment. If I don't get them into treatment before they leave, the minute they walk out the door, I feel they're lost. So the way to deal with this crisis is get them into treatment. Right. And what about naloxone? Naloxone. Who, could, who would like to, you or Dr. Johnson? No, tell everybody what naloxone is. Yeah, so, so opiates work. We said they, they suppress harmful feelings in your brain. But another thing that they do is turn off your respiratory drive, and they cause you to stop breathing. And that's how people are dying of these overdoses. When you inject these opiates or take large doses, they, they, they shut off your brain and that turns off your breathing and your blood oxygen levels drop and then your brain dies from a lack of oxygen. Naloxone is a prescription drug that acts on the exact same receptor, only instead of turning it on, it turns it off. So it's an antidote, it's a reversal agent, it's the opposite of an opiate. Naloxone is a wonderful, wonderful antidote. It works very quickly and completely reverses opiates as long as they haven't taken more opiate than the naloxone that we can give. Um, a couple of years ago, remember we said this was a prescription drug, a couple of years ago our state legislature uh, unanimously approved naloxone to be available at local pharmacies. So a pharmacy can provide doses of naloxone. You have to pay for it. It's not cheap. It's $90. But you have this antidote, this reversal that you can carry around in your pocket. Um, and if you find someone who's been suspected of having an overdose, you can give them this drug and wake their brain back up so that they start breathing again. Okay. And uh, this is available to third party uh, persons. So you don't have to have the opioid problem to get this prescription filled. Uh, they will give it to third party. So if you know somebody that's using um, uh, opioids, you can get it uh, and possibly save their life. Right. And I, I wanted to, because I know some of you might have questions if you've written them down on the little cards. And if you have some questions, you can um, pass them forward. Uh, we have some. 
pass them forward and, and we'll have some time for that. Please write down your questions. I wanted to um, reinforce before we leave, before I forget though, uh, part of the reason you're learning all this information is so you can go out there perhaps and save lives. How can you do that? You can make sure that you can pass on this information to people. Uh, if you know people who have opiates for bona fide reasons, to not share drugs with other people, um, to let them know about this, and to warn them about the fentanyl. Fentanyl is so popular out there with the drug dealers now because it's a lot less expensive. It's a lot less expensive. But a lot of young people don't know that they are getting fentanyl in the drugs they're buying. So you can warn them about this high-powered um, synthetic drug that they're getting that could kill them the very first time. The very first time. 33 people died one night in Philly, we were told at this summit. One night in Philly, um, homeless people were, died because they were around the, just around the fentanyl that had been dumped. So it's, it's very powerful. The other thing I want to say before I forget, <laughs> while we wait for some of these questions, is that if any of you young people are at parties and you, any of your um, uh, the young people are passed out, please just don't let them lay down and sleep it, sleep it off. Uh, they, had a young, they had four overdose deaths that I know of at LSU this year, this semester alone. And one of the, ch um, one of the young people around the corner from one of my son's uh, dorms uh, was passed out. He was drunk, his, you know, poisoned his body with too much alcohol and the body tried to repel it and he is asphyxiated. And that's what happened. So they need help too. Alcohol is equally dangerous. And that's very important that you know that. Do we have any questions? Joy, did you have something? I just wanted to say that, yes. um, you know, I am seeing a lot of young people uh -huh. uh, who have become addicted to heroin. Mm -hmm. uh, I see uh, professionals. Right. So again, uh, it, it goes across all class lines, uh, socioeconomic status. Uh, so it's not no longer jazz musicians and derelicts on the street. It's, uh, you know, everybody, is it's affecting us well you know and it's 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 something because i remember when i um when my son was well into recovery and i asked him what his drug of choice was and he looked at me and he said heroin and i said well did you shoot it up huh, i would never have done that i said what'd you do and he said i sniffed it well that was one step away you know that was one step away they think they're not but then the brain wants a higher rush and bam they're shooting up all right First question is, how do, and anyone can take the question, how do you administer lenox, lenoxol? Naloxone, yeah. I don't, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it says I don't know the spelling. How do you administer it? Sure, so when naloxone. you go to the pharmacy and pick it up, you can get it either as an injection or as a nasal spray. And one of the requirements when this was approved to be available to pharmacies for anyone, anyone can go pick this up. Uh, one of the requirements is that the pharmacist has to counsel you on how to use it. So when you pick it up, make sure that they take it out of the package for you and show you what it looks like. But, but just very briefly, it can either be injected into, like, into your leg or to your butt, like a big muscle in your leg, or it comes as a nasal spray and you just push it up against the nose and squirt it into the nose and you do one on each side. So they're really made to be very simple to use. Um, whichever of those two devices you feel more comfortable with, go talk to your pharmacist and have them show you what it looks like and show you how to use it. There's lots of pictures on the internet. There's YouTube videos that you can watch to learn how to use them. Um, it's, it's really quite simple. It's made so that anyone can do it. Right, and naloxone is to save a life. It's, absolutely, it's, absolutely. It's the intent, not used in treatment. It's specifically to save a life. The intent of this is to wake someone up who has passed out from an overdose, to wake their brain up and turn their breathing back on to save their life. All right, because we have a question here that says, is it and being I mean, used just, in treatment like an abuse? Just add to that. Uh -huh. If you give that naloxone, do call 911 because the, uh, the half-life of naloxone is shorter than the uh, half-life of the heroin, fentanyl, which they take. Actually, fentanyl is uh, fairly short acting, but heroin has a longer acting half life. So do call 911. And it's not being used like an abuse, which is for, to prevent somebody from drinking. Right, right. So it's specifically to save someone's life. What are benzos? What are benzos, Dr. Webster? I guess I mentioned that, so I'll. Uh, benzos are benzodiazepines, it's a class of sedatives. Uh, they act at a different receptor than uh, the opioids uh, act at, 
Uh, but they are also very dangerous in overdose and can depress respiration. Can you name a, a benzo for them? Sure, Valium, Clonopin, Ativan, Cirax, that class. Okay. What part are insurers play, playing in improving the treatment process in terms of possibly speeding up prior authorization? You want to take that, Michael Cartwright? Sure, I'll take that. <laughs> Trick question. Look, I'll, 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 I will say, huh? oh, is, is, as much as Oh, there's I, something on the back, sorry, for treatment that can serve as alternatives to prescriptions. Okay. Uh, two, two things. I could speak all day on insurance companies. <laughs> um, look, in 2008, uh, the Parity Act was passed, Mental Health Parity Act, which Substance abuse now is supposed to be treated like any other disease. And the insurance companies have done a lot over the last 15 years to try to provide resources available for intensive outpatient, outpatient services, detoxification services. They try to follow the ACM guidelines the best they can uh, to be able to pay for uh, different treatment interventions. Um, so I don't, I don't want to knock them too much because I do feel like that in this country, I've, I've traveled around the world on this particular disease and issue, and the United States probably has the most robust uh, treatment system in the world, right, compared to other industrialized nations, including the UK, France, Germany. We really do have the most robust uh, addiction treatment uh, system in the world. And I have to say, insurance companies play a part in that, right? But we have to continue to push them and the federal government uh, to try to find research dollars available and other interventions available. I do feel like that we've been using some similar models now for the past 30 or 40 years that we probably should upgrade in this country. And I think that we're going to need the insurance company and the federal and state government's help in trying to push that forward. Okay. Those who suffer from pain and think they need opiates, what can be brought about to stop the addiction? Anybody? Um, yeah. I'm a firm believer in uh, integrative medicine, uh, alternative medicine, uh, such things as acupuncture, acupressure, uh, uh, dry needling, uh, movement exercise, um, you know, there's yoga, yeah, yeah, yoga, physical therapy. All those things can be used for chronic pain, specifically things like trigeminal neuralgia. It doesn't need opioids. It needs, uh, um, uh, you know, Tegretol or carbamazepine. Uh, so there's medications that uh, can be used for each type of uh, individual chronic pain uh, syndrome. You don't need opioids. As we've said before, there is no physiological basis for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. You cannot show me where opioid therapy has any effect on the underlying in somebody that's suffering from chronic pain, excluding cancer pain. I'd like to just add one more thing that I don't think we think of very often, and it's weight loss. Um, in this country, if you take a look at our weight in the United States compared to other countries around the world, we have a lot more weight on us as a country, which leads to pain as you get older, in your knees, in your back. Um, and one of the things that's just a very simple method is just losing weight, right, instead of taking a pill. Mm -hmm. And so many times, just simple things like that, uh, we, we ran a weight loss program for years, and what we found is most of the patients that struggled with weight issues also had chronic pain. And so once they got the weight off, most of the pain symptoms actually went away. Okay. And I would add changing our expectations. I don't think any of us should expect to live 100% pain-free. I don't think we can expect to go through life without a little bit of a limp and a little bit of a crink. And I think that we need to change our expectations about how we live with pain and not let it affect us emotionally and learn to deal with it rather than expecting it to be completely eliminated. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this question is for Dr. Wetzman. Are you saying that someone can be born with the gene that makes them addicted to anything that makes them feel good and gives them an instant gratification? Yes. Uh, there are people born with the disease of addiction. It isn't a gene. 
There isn't a gene for addiction. Uh, there are a number of genes that, uh, that we know of that, and I'm sure we'll find more, as, as uh, Mr. Cartwright said, and, um, but, but we've already identified several that affect the reward pathway, and we can use knowledge of, of a person's uh, genetics to actually determine which medical treatment would be best for that person uh, in their addiction treatment. And if we did apply this to uh, children, uh, we might very well be able to prevent cases of addiction. I'll give you just one example. This is not the gene for addiction. Please hear me say that multiple times. Just one, one of many. But there is a there is an enzyme we all have called MTHFR, uh, and it changes the folate you eat into L-methylfolate. L-methylfolate is the only form of folate your brain can use, and it needs L-methylfolate to make dopamine. If you don't make enough L-methylfolate from the folate you eat, you won't make enough dopamine. And uh, so there are some people who about uh, 20 to 30 percent of the general population that has a uh, polymorphism of that gene and doesn't make enough of the enzyme and doesn't consequently make enough L-methylfolate. Well, you can take L-methylfolate as a vitamin supplement. Taking folic acid won't work. You have to take L-methylfolate. About 20 to 30 percent of the general population have this polymorphism. When we looked at, at patients who came to Townsend for treatment, 80 percent of them had a polymorphism of MTHFR. And so this is just one of those genetic factors that really concentrates people. And when you think about, we're not talking about big prescription medications. We're talking about essentially what is a B vitamin, like B9 is essentially, it's, it's a form of B9. So uh, we're talking about a very simple, cheap way to affect a great number of people uh, who are born with a, a major uh, genetic deficit in their ability to feel reward on a daily basis. Okay. And let me ask you before we move on, is it true that people can trigger themselves into addiction e by the abuse, the repetitive abuse of alcohol so or other drugs, even if they don't maybe have that yes. genetic Yes, so there, there are three ways you get addiction. One is to be born with it. The second is from stress, and we know the exact form of that stress, at least two of those forms. Uh, physical isolation and feeling less than others will lower your dopamine receptor density, lower your dopamine tone, and create the same symptoms. And the third way is to use drugs, because every time you use a drug, you, the dopamine high is so high, if you have a genetically normal brain, the dopamine high is so high that the brain reacts by actually killing off dopamine-producing cells at a faster rate than they die just by normal aging. And so if you look at, as, as an example, <coughs> the uh, Vietnam era GIs who were using heroin, it's a pretty classic cultural meme, everyone's heard of them, and everyone's heard that 95% of them put down heroin when they came back from Vietnam and never picked it up again. Mm -hmm. But what we didn't hear is the 25-year follow-up study is that th those GIs had showed alcoholism 25 years after they left Vietnam in much greater numbers than a non-heroin using uh, combat matched group from Vietnam. So it, even though they were 18, 19 years old and didn't have addiction and were just using drugs to uh, medicate combat in essence, they lost enough of those dopamine producing cells that that part of the brain aged faster and they crossed that line into addiction much, much faster than their non-heroin using uh, cohort. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this question is for doc, uh, Mr. Cartwright or Ms. Johnson, Dr. Johnson. What is the difference between the patient who uses the 12-step program to get clean and the patient who gets meds for this? By medication for treatment, mm -hmm. I think what we're probably talking about are drugs that work like partial opiates. So they, they, you can take methadone, you can take 
um, buprenorphine, Subutex, Suboxone. These are medications that patients use in treatment regimens that bind to the same receptor as the opiate and they turn it on a little bit, a little bit. And what that does is it gives a little bit of stimulation to help reduce the craving, the need, the urgency for the opiate feeling, for the addiction. And what it does is while you're using that therapy, because you don't have the addiction cravings as much, that gives you a chance to reset your life, to think about the other steps involved in the addiction recovery process because you've kind of turned off that little voice in your head that's screaming, I need more, I need more. And it gives you a chance to use some of the other steps. No, I totally agree. I, look, the first three years of recovery, I took medications. And so medications can assist in someone staying clean and sober. And I think that medication-assisted therapy should be embraced in this country as a way to help people wean off of uh, drugs that are more dangerous. And also what we don't talk about is medications to help with mental health issues as well, whether that be anti-anxiety medications, uh, whether that be antidepressants, or whether that be someone that has schizophrenia, mm -hmm. right? Lots of people have psychosis. And I know uh, Dr. Wetzman believes that that is the brain and the disease of addiction. I think there's also multiple other things that can be going on with that brain. And whether it's helping someone wean off of higher doses of medication, uh, like what methadone and other medications are doing, or taking antidepressants or other things, medication can play a key role in someone staying clean and sober long term. And so I think they work hand in hand. There's sometimes a disagreement between the 12-step community and physicians over this concept, but I actually think they work quite nicely together. And if you take a look at 12-step programs, there's actually uh, AA's response to medication, and it's actually let your physician work with you on your medication issues, mm -hmm. not your 12-step program. Before we leave here, I don't want to forget to ask this question. Dr. Nora Volokov with um, NIDA said that marijuana does produce addiction. I'd like your opinions about that because that's a big issue here in Louisiana. Um, we're hearing a lot about medical marijuana and um, legalizing it for medical purposes, but marijuana in and of itself is not medicine, is it? It's a big concern here in Louisiana. Marijuana produces, it's, as a plant, produces a chemical that may have medicinal properties. Right. We still, there's a long way to go in the research as to how that, that chemical can be used in, in diseases. Um, what we do know about marijuana is that lots of things are addictive. You all have games on your cell phones that are addictive. And when your kids are tugging on your, your jackets and saying, hey, mom, hey, dad, and you're playing on your phone, that's, that's an addiction, too. And um, many people have addictions to food. Many people have addictions to, to their social lives. This dopamine spike that you get in your brain reward center that makes you feel good, that makes you feel happy, that we're calling an addiction, can be triggered by hundreds of things, ranging from video games to social activities to drugs and alcohol to the sparkly lights on your cell phone, any of it. And I think marijuana is, is another substance that has a social culture and that has physiologic happy feelings, relaxation, and stress relief. It's another substance that can, that can lead to feelings of addiction. Um, what marijuana is not going to do is lead to overdose deaths. Smoking marijuana is not going to cause an acute death, an overdose death, the way these opiates can easily, easily. Just one minute you're alive and the next minute you're not. And that, that marijuana is not going to do. Okay. Um, th this we can give to Dr. Maystreet. Are there any changes in the university curriculum that educates new pharmacists, doctors, um, about the disease of addiction. So in our 
own pr uh, curriculum here at Xavier, actually, in the pharmacy school, we just added to the curriculum uh, a course on substance abuse. And, it's, and I think it's something that has been kind of swept under the rug in the past. And, and I know when I was a student, in fact, as well, we didn't have any exposure. It was only offered as an elective, and, and only a handful of people would take the class. And, and that was it. We were kind of thrown out into the world and, and into practice. Um, without really getting the exposure that was necessary in substance abuse. And I, and I think now it's very important, I think, of a lot of uh, institutions in both pharmacy and medicine and, and all around in, in colleges everywhere are constantly now including substance abuse into their curriculums in order to get the word out and, and get people the knowledge that is necessary on these disease states. Uh, because as we had mentioned, uh, a lot of people are not getting the ideas, they're not getting the knowledge, and nobody knows about it. They're not getting the funding, of course, as well. And, and substance abuse has been kind of on the back burner. And so I think it's a, it's a great thing and a very important thing that we are getting this into all of our colleges as well um, in order to educate our youth on, it, on this okay. topic. Can I uh, add something? Yes. The American Society of Addiction Medicine annual meeting happened to be here this month in New Orleans, and a lot of my colleagues were here, and I, I had an opportunity to interview seven of them. And one of the interview questions was, how many hours of uh, intentional education did you get in medical school on addiction? And for every one of them answered less than five hours. And I said, I in your area right now, how many hours of intentional instruction on addiction is there in your medical school? And it was less than five hours. And we're talking about something that's the leading motive force behind the top five causes of death in this state. I understand that um, th it was four hours and they had six hours for veterinarians. They got it <laughs> more because I guess the animals can't speak. Um, what percentage of the 10 to 20 percent of people who suffer from substance use disorder also have or could be diagnosed with co-occurring occurring disorders? Who would like to take that? Anybody know that I, figure? I, I think there's a little bit of a, a, do we mean that they actually have true mental illness or do we mean that they actually ha are exhibiting symptomatology of mental illness? And, and so if you ask how many people are getting diagnosed with a mental illness when they come into treatment, it's as high as 90%. If you take a look at that one year post-treatment, two years post-treatment, and say how many is it, it's a lot less than that. I'd say 30 to 50%. I don't know that we have exact studies on that. Dr. Wetzman, do you want to opine? Well, it, it, you know, it's, it's I s you see these things in the newspaper, and you'll see reports from the federal government. And, and uh, I heard someone say once that, that science is the process of finding the fewest number of assumptions that explain the largest number of, of observations. And you've got to remember these facts that you hear from scientists are assumptions. And so the assumptions are buried in how we define things. So it comes down to what definitions you use. And right now, in all of these, these high-priced studies you're seeing that are funded by the federal government, the definitions are all behaviorally based out of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, of the uh, American Psychiatric Association. And so if you behave in a certain way, you meet criteria for the illness. And I think what Mr. Cartwright's pointing out is there's a lot of overlap between how people act when they have major depressive disorder, which is a completely different brain disease than uh, addiction. And, but there's a lot of overlap. And so uh, you could get diagnosed with one when you have the other. Um, and so it is after treatment when, I think I mentioned this before, unfortunately in our diagnostic nomenclature, after you've stopped using a substance for six months, there is no way for a doctor to explain your symptoms with addiction. So the only thing they can do is make another diagnosis. Mm -hmm. There's just, there's literally no way in this country using the standard diagnosis that we use for someone to look at your symptoms after you've stopped using a drug and say, this is the brain disease of addiction. And so 
there are still, even after a lot of people who, who uh, get diagnosed, do we know how many of them actually have another biological mental illness? No, we don't because no one's actually ever studied it. All right, this is an interesting question. Are there laws in the U.S. slash China that punish individuals caught with fentanyl? And how are, are these people um, intimidated by this so they won't distribute? Well, I think that answer is no. But um, are there laws? Yes. Who would like to answer that? Yes, there are laws. Uh, you cannot um, uh, have fentanyl in your possession unless you're okay. registered, uh, hospital, clinical setting, uh, some sort. Uh, otherwise, it's uh, illicit. So there are laws to, uh, you know, to monitor fentanyl use in the United States. Right. And they told us at the summit also that China is now working with the U.S. to put up restrictions so that fentanyl can't come into the country. We'll see if that really happens. Um, and I guess maybe, would you like to have one closing remark because we've run out of time? Because I know one thing that you've really stressed is we've got to educate people about the value of our brain, which is literally the boss of our body, that this is an overall health issue. And if we can understand it from there and start educating our public, our young people especially from ground zero and up, we can tackle this problem. Right now we're just like band-aiding it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, again, I think this starts in the home. Right, educating ourselves that, yeah. and educating our loved ones of the disease of addiction. If you have someone in your life that's struggling with this disease, don't be silent, right? Bring it up, talk to them about it, work with a professional to intervene if they are, are resistant to getting help. Uh, this is a very preventable illness and it's very treatable and you can live a healthy, productive life without drugs and alcohol in your system. And so all I ask is that whatever you've learned today, if you, if you know someone or you're aware of someone that's struggling, please help them. Okay. And I want to remind everyone that they will be in the outside of, in the corridor, well, right here, I guess, signing books. You can re receive these books free of charge. There are consultants outside that also that will um, answer your questions. If you have personal questions you want to ask people, but start talking about this because you guys are really the soldiers out there. If you can just pass this information on to one person, one person, you can help stem the tide of, of the deaths, the preventable deaths in our country, in our city, in our state. So thanks for coming. We appreciate it.